Well, hello everyone. Great to see you here. Welcome in The Hague. Uh, I live in the Netherlands, for me it's a home game. Uh, but I'm very excited to see you here today to talk about GovTech. And uh, we've already talked about uh, the topic of the panel, right? So is the GovTech boom still booming? Obviously, uh, as professor of GovTech, I have my strong opinions about that. And I think it's also a big risk that I have been made moderator of this session, right? So a guy that makes his living teaching and talking about GovTech shouldn't be moderating a session, but I'm quite confident we'll do well because we have a very great panel here today. Let me just briefly introduce them to you. So we have uh, Ping Soon Soon. Uh, he's Chief Executive of Government Technology Agency uh, at Singapore, in Singapore. Welcome. Thank you. We have uh, Nella uh, Liusk, who's Ambassador at Large for Digital Affairs uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Estonia. Uh, we have Java. I hope, I'm sorry, it's not great. <laughs> um, but she's Vice Minister uh, of the Ministry of Economic and Innovation uh, at the Republic of Lithuania. And last but definitely not least, we have Alina Merlard, who is co-founder and uh, COO of Citizen Lab. Welcome. Thank you. An applause. <laughs> So the setup of this panel is very simple. We have three teams we would like to discuss, first with the panel, but obviously we'll open up the room for questions from you guys as well. Uh, these teams are first, we'll talk about the importance of GovTech. Uh, is it still relevant and why is it especially relevant then today? Uh, the second uh, team we'll talk about is, we know GovTech is here for some years now. We've been talking about it. Uh, so we know the potential as well. And what do we need to do next? How do we uh, go beyond where we are today? And the third theme is about collaboration and knowledge sharing. I'm pretty sure you have all kinds of questions and ideas on that as well. But first, last, let me ask uh, our panel here to um, share their thoughts and ideas on the first topic, which is the importance of GovTech. Anyone, wh why is it important for you? Ladies first, of course. <laughs> Nell, would you like to start? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not from government, so I run my own um, GovTech company, um, and we think it's really important because um, technology gives us the opportunity to reach more people, involve more people, um, and also during like these special times from the pandemic to now like changing economic and political landscapes, um, technology can really help us innovate. I think in times of crisis, we tend to, as humans, stick to what we know, but we should push ourselves to keep on innovating, to have like a return on, on, on that investment. So I definitely think um, GovTech is booming uh, over the past seven years. Uh, we grew from Belgium to more than 15 countries and same with public. So we can really see that um, both GovTech players, but then also government is investing more and more in, uh, in technology. Yeah, can I ask you just a brief follow-up question on that? Do you see different uh, attitudes towards GovTech um, in these different countries? Um, yes, <laughs> definitely. I think it really depends on, on culture and, and politics, but um, each country will have its own reasons why they think um, investing in technology um, mm -hmm. is important. Is it for efficiency? Is it for reaching more people? Um, so to give one example, so I'm, I'm from Belgium, but um, we work a lot also in, in the Netherlands, and I think one of the things that we're facing today is, is that's not yeah an, an, an energy crisis uh, since since this year or or energy challenges um, and I think what we're doing a lot with local governments in in the Netherlands is actually involving people in that energy transition. I think the Netherlands is really one of the innovators um, in that space. So it's possible to have these difficult conversations with citizens and ask them like, okay, if we want to invest in renewable energy, where should we do it? How will we do it collectively? Yeah. Because it's a big, uh, because it's a big investment. So there are many, many good examples and I'm curious to hear others. Yeah, I think me too. Yeah, would you like to add something? Thank some? you for having us here today. First of all, uh, I think this panel really represents the beauty of a GovTech. We are here from all walks of life, from public, private sector, uh, academia, and from all over the world, actually. So I think that GovTech stays relevant, really, because it's a universal approach to problem solving. You know, first of all, it allows uh, 
us coming from public sector to familiarize with the latest technology. And Nell already mentioned that some of today's problems, they cannot be solved without the latest technology, be it intensified cyber attacks or uh, healthcare uh, pandemics, the recent pandemics. So all these problems will, would not ever be solved without uh, latest technology. And us in the public sector, we are, you know, uh, we need to catch up, do, we need to stay afloat, we need to be riding the technology wave all the time. So GovTech allows us to do that. Also, uh, GovTech uh, gives us not only the tools and finances needed, it gives us a mandate to employ those latest solutions. I, imagine the situation, for example, you know the problem, but only you and few of your colleagues know that the problem does exist. And you may also know the solution, it might be a very exquisite one or very, how to say, out of a box solution. And you might be afraid to risk and uh, do it on your own because if you fail, media would be rolling you in the mud yeah. and <laughs> you might be, you know, become an enemy of a state actually. So GovTech really allows you to share this risk between institutions and gives the mandate to the public servant. So I think that it's really, really important for this. And also it allows academia and SMEs to, you know, familiarize with some of societal problems that are very important today, but they might be even more important tomorrow. For example, uh, right now in Lithuania, we have a startup and it's a GovTech initiative where we are, uh, uh, where the, we have developed a system uh, to calculate uh, the damage done to farmer crops by herd of bisons. Oh. Uh, it's wow. <laughs> it might not seem a very big problem. And today the, the startup is uh, calculating uh, how much crops did we lose due to the herds of bisons, but tomorrow they might be working on a very serious topic, for example, global hunger or uh, species at the risk of extinction. So I think that this GovTech approach really uh, is universal and it allows us you know, to look into current and in future problems uh, thoroughly. Wow, very powerful message. And I think it resonates a lot with uh, what we see here uh, in the Netherlands as well. The potential of adding new features, functionalities to these technologies to adapt to current uh, uh, challenges we face in society. That's, uh, that's very powerful. Thank you very much. Nelle, why is GovTech important? Thank you. Uh, of course, I agree with uh, everything that has been said here. And uh, I would like to add that from, from our point of view, GovTech is actually more important than ever before. If you look GovTech as digitalization of our society and large, because as you also pointed out, we are living in very difficult times currently. So we have had one crisis after the other. And I believe what the war in Ukraine has showed us is that what we are today talking, let's say government digitalization, private sector digitalization, it's no longer about efficiency, modernization, user friendliness, doing together, bringing us together, and all the nice things which are very important, but it's increasingly about our security. And not only national security, but also a security of every single person living in, in our countries. And we see currently increasingly cyber attacks, not only on critical infrastructure or government information systems or, or databases, that we used to see, let's say in the past, we see increasingly everybody being attacked. So it is reaching the, the public sphere. And that means that building security or cyber security capacity is no longer enough. Mm -hmm. We have to be all digitally very strong. And this is something that we have definitely taken from, uh, from Estonia. If we didn't have a strong digital identity, yeah that everybody uses, not just some random PIN codes. It would be very difficult to protect our kindergartens, schools, hospitals, and of course, also, also government uh, services. So I think this is take definitely one, one, let's say, addition to why we have to uh, keep doing what we have been doing. And, uh, and the second thing, of course, as uh, again, the Ukraine has, has shown, Governments need to be ready to provide services under all circumstances. And, and we thought that, okay, COVID was tough, 
but uh, but uh, but we can see that um, it does not stop there. So so we we simply need to be digitally stronger. Wow, we are uh, very recognizable. You basically talk about this concept of digital sovereignty, right? That we want to be more in control of the technology we have uh, and are using, and not depend a lot on all kind of other uh, actors. And a second concept is resilience, really allowing our society to adapt to all these crises that we're facing. So very important. Thank you so much. Ping. Sure, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more with, with all the speakers over here. In a way, you're preaching to the converted over here, <laughs> right? So I mean, the question whether GovTech boom is still booming, the answer must be yes, right? I, I think, in fact, uh, that's certainly the case in Singapore. I think the very fact that you know, citizens and business adoption of digital solutions have accelerated during COVID. And the fact that at least in Singapore, we've mounted a very decisive and effective response through digitalization uh, to respond to COVID. I think this has all created the momentum. And in fact, in Singapore, we are doubling down and locking in the gains of digitalization. And I totally agree with you. I mean, look at the times that we are today, right? It is great times of uh, economic volatility just coming up from COVID. Now we are hit with the supply chain disruption. We have high inflation and an impending recession. I think any government that could actually tap the power of digital to do three things. One, to improve productivity so we can do more with less. Number two, to improve service delivery so that we can be more targeted, deliver things to our citizens faster in a more personalized manner. And three, to manage volatility, right? To increase sensing through data and to better manage the resilience. I think these are the governments that's gonna come out ahead uh, better than the rest. So the answer is yes, it's booming and certainly not all news. And uh, if the size of any organization could be a measure, I mean, GovTech in Singapore, we have almost doubled our headcount during COVID. Started about 1,008 about two years ago, and today we are 3,005. Wow. We will continue to invest in building up the internal capacity for us to deliver better services to our citizens. Wow, yeah, wow, amazing uh, to see that growth. And uh, you mentioned important points there as well, which also connect very well to, to the, the, the second uh, theme for today. You mentioned uh, speed and philosophy. Um, GovTech has been there, so th this conference is already five years old. Um, we have seen a couple of reports, right? We have the World Bank report on GovTech. This year, we actually, 2022, we had uh, three reports. If I remember correctly, we had the reports from the Joint U Research Council from the European Union, really talking about this potential of GovTech. It's there, we should capture it. We also had this uh, report commissioned by the uh, European Parliament on GovTech. Um, we see, we recognize the potential of GovTech to help citizens to address big social uh, economic challenges. At the same time, we also feel that it's not going quickly enough. And I would like the panel to really think or share their ideas on, okay, what might slow us down? What is slowing us down now? And what can we do about it? Any thoughts? I may start. Yeah. Uh, we actually uh, understand that for GovTech initiatives to uh, move forward with them, we need to evaluate our results and do the impact assessment of what GovTech actually gives us because we are investing in the innovation and we need to see, you know, the outcome and was proving not that only some specific solution works, that, but also that our GovTech uh, uh, institutions do work as well. So we surveyed um, 70 participants of our GovTech challenges and actually we asked what is stopping uh, those initiatives from uh, spreading? And uh, of course, first of all, it was IT and project management skills. Uh, because uh, if you need to you know, uh, do a great innovation, digitalization in the public sector, you need to have specific skills. And for we are competing for talent with private sector. And it's very hard. So we need yeah. to mm -hmm. work on uh, attracting and retaining talent. Also, uh, we must, you know, answer to ourselves, first of all, um, do some specific problems need a GovTech and innovation, the out-of-a-box solution, or are we simply talking about some digitalization? And we must communicate that, we must employ the right tools for the right problems. Third, I think that there is a 
difference between agile uh, methodology and, of course, public procurement. Because agile uh, methodology, which is in the heart of AgopTech, it really requires constant iterations, constant improvements, the review process, and uh, public procurement is a very different process. It's all about documentation, uh, clear processes, fine prints, and, uh, of course, the risk aversion that I mentioned before. So we need to make our public procurement more agile so that yeah. we could employ the right modern technology in the public sector. Um, of course, continu project continuity, that means that um, sometimes we uh, try and test some great idea, but uh, we reinvent the wheel uh, every time because we don't know how to continue with the project and we start uh, to do everything from the scratch. So I think that it's very, very important to uh, learn the good practices in events like this one. So oh. I, 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 yes. I totally agree with that, right? So I think if you are trying to drive digital to the core for any organization in the government, it's really not the technology, right? It boils down to culture, people, and organization. Um, you know, there's a later a panel talk about how every public leader not got to be a digital leader, but there's a saying, right? You got to match ambition with alignment and action. So based on the experience I have uh, running GovTech, and, uh, and I'll just paraphrase some of the things you say, I think there are three things we need to do to overcome it. I think number one is really to uh, get the business strategy alignment with the operations. I think it's easy to say that you want digitalization, but it cannot just be from the leader of the organization. It really needs to go down to the rank and to ensure that the operations and the technology people work together. And importantly, to make sure that the operations look at how they can re-engineer their processes. We talk a lot about not digitizing today's processes. You got to go through a business process re-engineering first. So that operations alignment is important. Otherwise, you're just going to get a lot of tech push and a lot of reinventing the wheel. Yeah. So the first thing is to get a business operation and strategy alignment. And the second one, I totally agree, and it's sometimes quite difficult in the government, which is that we need to introduce new ways of work, and the new ways of work including uh, different ways of identifying problems. The use of service journey mapping, customer experience mapping is very useful in understanding the pain point of citizen, both in terms of the activities that happen above the line of visibility and down at the engine rooms. But not just in terms of using service journey mapping, but then to couple that with modern engineering practices, right? The use of agile rather than waterfall, the ideas of understanding what story point is, how do you do MVP, and how do you sensitize the citizens to some of these. And in that process, kind of increase the digital quotient of the public service, not just the leader, not just the business operations, but down to the ranks, right? So that everybody speak the language of, of, of uh, digitalization. Not that you need them to learn coding, but at least appreciate the power of technology. And then finally, of course, to complement the business strategy alignment, complementing with new ways of working, is you need to focus on technology. And I'll argue that today, government need to have a very flexible technology core, one that embraces the cloud and to embrace reusability and platform, government as a platform. And uh, so, for example, in Singapore today, about 60% of government systems are already hosted on the, on the commercial cloud. And we have developed a Singapore government tech stack that's a modern application environment to really standardize and streamline the whole development process. Wow, uh, what you're saying, this definitely reflects a quite mature and experienced approach already with GovTech. And I'm, I'm very curious to learn more about that. But before going there, one of the key concerns I see about GovTech when I speak to public, people from the public sector is this notion of, okay, wait, GovTech is basically coming from the outside. It's about technology from startups, scale-ups, enterprises, and uh, th they want to do something in the public sector. And you have this concern that basically, as a government, you are going to be dependent on the public sec uh, private sector. Um, Java, when you were mentioning the, this approach to GovTech uh, and, the, and also Ping, you, you have matured a lot and have been able to scale. How do you feel that this attitude towards GovTech coming in from the outside and basically is more a Trojan horse, uh, right? Uh, we're going to be dependent on the private sector. Do you see this happening or are we going beyond that now? Do we, are we in a different stage of maturity of for embracing GovTech? Do you want to try this? Uh, so, so I would say that uh, it is not an us against them. I think a lot of time there's just no way, right, we mm. can deliver public tech, you know, through our own capability. Uh, so even as we try to move things in-house, there's still a large dependent on the partnership. Mm. And I would, I, would, I would say that in many cases, it's a very symbiotic relationship. 
But the way we work with the vendors have to change, yeah. right? Instead of huge projects on a waterfall method that you define the specs and get a project like, like 36 months down the road, and often it's over budget and, and, yeah. and uh, uh, not on schedule, you got to be, do co-development with the, with the private sector. And that's what we do. So we have our own development team, we augment it with private sector developers, and we co-create a product together. But at the same time, I think there's a great opportunity for government to create platforms that are on open source, that actually allow private sector to work on it. So in Singapore, for example, uh, we have developed the Open Attestation Framework. It's an open source framework using uh, DLT technology to verify as well as the issue certificates. So it's open source framework. We have applied that on uh, what we call OpenSource, which is the issuance of educational certificates. So the government developed the open source framework, but the provider that issued the certificates and verified the certificates are, from, are all from the private sector. And now we have pivoted and forked out the open attestation framework to do trade, right? So can you imagine, right? Now the, all the electronics, uh, the, the bill of laden that's required for the shipping industry can now be issued through the open attestation framework. And that helps shippers save time, help the processing department in government save time, and it releases money faster to the shippers. And all these solutions can be provided by the private sector. I do want to yeah. maybe quickly yep. reply to that being from, from the private sector. I think I tend to disagree because uh, there is, of course, more increasing funds spent on technology and in some way, indeed, the, the, the public sector will be dependent on, on the private sector. But I think the public sector is spending much more um, on services from the private sector, consultants, etc. So I think um, from a, a, a GovTech player, I think what's sometimes blocking or what, what can be a barrier to working w more with governments is actually that, that willingness to pay, seeing, okay, the technology has a value comparing to hiring a very expensive consultant, which is also outsourcing and being dependent on a private sector to help you solve, solve challenges. So I think really that perception on the price of technology and how much it can really help you and how much it's worth, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a conversation that we need to have. Uh, and then of course, um, we need to make sure that your, the government has some control over what they're buying, how they can modify it, they need to have internal skills. So uh, Citizen Lab also, we, uh, part of our solution is open source so that we can exactly allow to co-create with yeah. uh, our clients, uh, with the governments. But so that, that willingness to pay and also in public procurement, not putting everything on price, but also really looking at like, what are the qualities of these people? Uh, who is this company? Are they diverse? Uh, what are their ethical standards, et cetera? Um, slowly, we see things changing also with regulations from the EU. But if we, for example, look at Canada, like public procurement is, is pretty intense, but they look at much more things than, than only price. So, so really looking at the quality of the technology and willing to pay for it um, is, is important to get good quality in the end. Yeah. A very important discussion there, and we, we, we noted two things, I think. Uh, one is this, this leadership also from the public sector, but also having control. And I'm pretty uh, curious about how someone from Estonia views this, because um, uh, my read on Estonia is there's a lot of uh, public leadership and control there. Is, is, is that fair to say, or would you say it's, it's, it's changing? Yeah, yeah, a quick wrap up, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of, <laughs> of uh, Estonia's uh, digitalization. And, uh, and on the one hand, I, I completely agree also what, uh, what was said here, that, uh, that governments have done quite a bit also uh, in Estonia. Uh, a lot is happening, proactive services, um, uh, AI applications, especially to support the efficiency of backend processes and so forth and so forth. But, uh, but when we let's say, narrow down now the, the, the GovTech as such, or, or why it in a way was, um, uh, let's say, starting to boom, even so, I would say that we are not yet booming in, uh, uh, in GovTech. We have done some things, but, but we are not definitely not yet there. And this is, is precisely what was also mentioned here. Uh, it was actually about uh, uh, sharing resources. So it's not about uh, public digital development or private sector digital uh, development. There are no differences in these technologies. Yeah. Of course, there are differences how we, you know, implement these technologies, let's say, in, in government, because we are 
in a certain sort of framework, yeah, regulatory framework, and, and our task is to help everybody, not only those who can afford to pay. Uh, so there are some differences, but ultimately it's about sharing of resources. And when we now look at it, we see some examples. But I would say that um, when we look at the global scale, um, uh, these examples are rather limited. Mm. They are happening, but uh, there could be more, because we, as, as we all talk here also, yeah. I'm pretty sure that my government needs are not so different from Singapore needs or, or, or Latvian needs, but how much we really s see pooling resources globally, or at least with our friends. Uh -huh. We see something happening. Um, in 2016, Estonian government together with our, I would say our closest neighbor, uh, Finland and also Iceland, we created uh, a foundation that develops and manages cross-border digital solutions. And we did that in Estonia uh, precisely because we needed to have also the talent from Finland, Iceland, and why not, um, uh, why not somebody else? So from this point of view, I think we have quite mm. a bit to do. And here, the public could also take the lead yeah. as it did also um, uh, in, the, in the previous years. Yeah. I think now so I'll touch mm -hmm. upon a very important thing. It's not about the sharing technology or mm -hmm. data, sometimes depersonalized data, between public sector and private sector. It's about sharing uh, our knowledge, first of all, with those with whom we share our values. And I think that's very important. Oh. Right now in the context of what's happening in Ukraine, Russia's war in Ukraine really opened, like it, it really reset the geographical boundaries of technology sharing, I think. But uh, of course, uh, that's a very important topic as well. Definitely, yeah, uh, and I would love to talk to you about that uh, later after the panel because a lot is happening there, right? So what we're seeing is this whole notion of um, closing the borders, uh, closed science versus open science. Uh, we, we want to keep technology and the way we develop it uh, closer at, at on a local level uh, and, and not, not be dependent. So I think there's a lot to talk about there as well. Um, I would like to move to, to the third topic because uh, we, we need to finish up the panel, obviously. Uh, the third topic is actually something you have already touched upon. It's collaboration and knowledge sharing. And I think this is really close to my heart because one of my roles is uh, academic director at DigiCampus. DigiCampus is a multi-helix innovation partnership uh, um, in which government, uh, companies, academics, universities, but also citizen groups participate in order to co-design these new technologies in public services. And I, having some experience with this now, DigiCampus is three years old, but I know there are examples across the world that try to do the same. I still feel that uh, the collaboration challenge is still there and we're, we're struggling with it. And the collaboration challenge is who takes the lead, right? So, uh, Ping, you were talking about um, an open source attestation framework. I think that's a great example, but who takes the lead? Who covers the cost? Who uh, uh, makes sure that the documentation is there? How do you approach this in Singapore? Yeah, so, so that's one area that we can, I think there's room for international collaboration. And it's not just about government getting involved in an open source framework. I mean, the idea that Estonia is doing, right, that government has a platform. I mean, she has said that indeed, actually many of the functionalities within the government is, mm, is, is the same. Government is very good at applying for grant, disperse money and all that. So how can we actually start to see government as a platform and the functionalities and the code base that we have developed, you know, can we then codify it and make it available for other governments to use? So in Singapore, for example, you know, we have implemented, I think, a rather successful national digital identity program, over 97% coverage of the residents. And it's not just a lock-in program. We have that did it together with a personal data sharing consent platform called MyInfo, and as well as a data sharing platform for the government. And actually, the coupling of these has created new value, not just for government services, but for private sector services. Yeah. So now that we can develop that platform, can we then extend it to the private sector? And private sector are making use of that same platform to simplify their EKYC process. We're generating new economic value through using some of these platforms. Now, could that same model be replicated? I think there's great possibilities. And something that's very specific that only governments can do is that we, if, if we can all pursue, right, and have an interoperable standard in terms of digital identity that's no different from passport, that allows travel and citizens and uh, businesses interaction across borders, 
to be seamless, I think that would be great. I mean, there's an EIDA standards being developed in the EU. I think if we can propagate that and allow more countries to have an interoperable standard, I think that would really bring about a closer global community. Very powerful examples. Other examples? I would maybe just uh, follow up um, uh, on, um, on what my colleague from Singapore uh, just said. I, I think we are, we are seeing this understanding that, uh, that we are now so different that we mm -hmm. cannot use, let's say, each other's uh, solutions or, 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 or really, I wouldn't say copy, but uh, amend yes. uh, what, what has been done. So, so there is uh, two movements. Um, one of them was, of course, uh, mentioned around um, uh, open source, and, and we see that becoming quite trendy, not only in the, in the European Union or, or in Estonia, where all our public, um, or the code of all our public developments needs to be open, and, and there is a repository for this that, that could be, in a way, um, uh, reused. We see that also in uh, uh, different international organizations and so forth. So there is definitely move towards um, open uh, standards, and, and there are also different initiatives. There is one initiative that you can also learn uh, today called GovStack that um, Estonia is doing together with Germany, uh, International Telecommunication Union and, and, uh, and Dial that does precisely that, that it collects the know-how from all over the world, from the public and the private sector and develops technical specifications for certain components that could be then reused. So it takes a, a, a bit of this building blocks based approach to digitalization, and, and I definitely see this as a, as a second trend, that we could see digital government in a way similar to, to let's say, private sector, I don't know, uh, Apple store, uh, uh, that, you, um, that, you, that you put together and, and amend and, and, and play there around a little bit, and, and you can have something that is up to, let's say, up to your liking. Uh, I, I also wanted to see that there's also a mindset challenge that we have to overcome. Because uh, for some of us, it's very hard, you know, to uh, try to employ foreign technologies and foreign solutions because, of course, it's very applicable to, you know, have some local problem, find a Lithuanian, for example, startup, which can solve the problem, maybe see how that startup grows to a unicorn and say, ah, we have a national champion, yeah? yeah. But maybe someone uh, all around the world has already solved the problem. And for example, we see a lot of the problem that it ha this open mindset helps you to solve is that we are actually experiencing a lack of supply here. And I know that Mayor of Vilnius, who will be in the panel here as well, he will be talking about his experiences. And I think that uh, he, will, he might tell you about that Vilnius is right now using a Brazil technology, for example, yeah. to monitor CO2 emissions. Aruna Matelita, who's our GovTech champion, she's all, she will also be in the panel, uh, may tell you a story about how uh, they had uh, made a challenge with uh, venture capitalists to find uh, 10 solutions to 10 corporate problems, uh, sustainability, mobility issues, and well, they couldn't find Lithuanian companies to solve those, all these problems, so they had to scout in Australia, United States, and all over the world, so we must not think that, like, yeah, we need to find a local solution and only a local solution. We must be open and try to employ all the best practices that are all over the world. And Very powerful message. Yeah, indeed. I think it's not only across countries or within continent, it's also across continents. Um, I think we, if we look at knowledge sharing, we often look at, at the West um, or I think um, high, I mean, standards when it comes to more high tech uh, technologies is, is important, but we can also be inspired by countries that are less digitally developed. Uh, we run a big uh, project with um, the Chilean government, the, the Ministry of Youth, to engage youth uh, and use technology. And we actually get challenged because over there, people are less digitally developed, they have less access to technology. So you need to be much more innovative to think about like how can we get this to people and that can actually then inspire us to do it better also in Europe. Uh, when we started, we actually got inspired by projects in uh, South America, in Africa. So not only looking at like how can we be inspired and share uh, knowledge on like very high tech, standards, but also just on the approach to uh, technology um, and to make sure that we, we reach um, all of our populations and not just the ones that have the, the digital skills. 
very important message. And I think actually you're answering one of the many questions. I see more than a dozen questions from the audience coming in. And this question was about uh, how do we close the gap between GovTech and all these citizens who are unable to yeah. use these technologies today or don't know the technologies yet. Yeah. So, uh, you so then it's really about the approach to technology, which devices are they using, how do they interact with government in public space, in city hall, and, and think about how we can actually get them to technology there, help them to use the technology. So I think that's, that's as important to, to grow I the adoption of GovTech. I, I want to add on, and I think that that is so true, right? I mean, a lot of time we talk about uh, technology in the public sector. I think the competition is not between the Singapore government, the Estonia, and the Lithuania government, right? Uh, in this area, we're all doing tech for public good, right? The competition, not so much a competition, I think the bar is being set by the private sector companies. And a lot of time, even in public sector agencies, we feel a need to kind of measure ourselves up against what the private sector services are. And a lot of time, we fall, we fall off the mark, right? But actually, that's okay. Because one big difference between public sector digital solutions and private sector is that we don't choose our customers. We need to provide services to be equitable to a diverse population, including those who are not able to help themselves or serve. Yeah. And a lot of time when, when government agencies pursue digital to the core, they forget that actually the public mission is to kind of serve your citizens with heart. So my, 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 my posit is that the future of public service delivery uh, it's not about just digitalization, right? It's yes to pursue simplicity with digital, but to add that human dimension. And of course, security is important. And to add that human dimension, it may well require us not to close our fiscal channels, right? To continue to maintain that, but you can actually apply technology to improve that. So I always say, you know, to use high tech for high touch. Yeah. Wow, that's, I think, a very <laughs> great final quote we can use. Uh, um, we need to finish up now. Uh, thank you very much. I think there is a lot more, and I know Eline and, and, and um, Yafa and um, uh, Ping also, and uh, Nella have a lot more knowledge they would love to share with us. Let's grab a coffee with them a bit later. Uh, thank you also, audience, for all your great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, run through them all, uh, but uh, thank you for uh, participating in this panel. Thank you, panel, and uh, we'll move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you.